going to talk about CSS sort of side by side. Um, they, they form two aspects, two important aspects of the web page. The HTML is the actual content, the text, the links, the images, multimedia, and so on. The CSS provides the appearance and the layout. All right? And those are two important components. And it's important to realize that when we do things to style our page, while it's certainly a goal to make our pages look good, that's not the only goal. Um, one of our goals is to make the pages easier to understand. So for example, you can use colors to group things together, all right, to make it, um, to, to, to group things together so that um, the user at a glance can see stuff that belongs together. Or to make things like the navigation stand out so it's obvious that these are your links, these are your navigations. So again, you're not just thinking in terms of making the page look nice. That's your goal. And also, uh, to use a marketing term, branding, you know, you want your user to get certain associations with what your products are based on how your web page looks. You know, for example, a heavy metal band is probably going to have a black web page. Barbie is probably going to have a pink uh, web page. Uh, Apple has a page that looks um, very modern, very simplistic, very sleek. And all these things sort of create an image about a product. So that's important. But also as important is a way that we can use these styling things to actually make the page more functional. To let the user at a glance tell how the page is divided into sections instead of just being this gigantic blob of text and images and so on down the line. All right. Um, so I start off this by talking about color because that's probably the most obvious thing to talk about. Um, throughout the semester, we'll talk about other things. We'll talk about laying out your page. We'll talk about fonts. We'll talk about borders and spacing and all kinds of other things. But color is a nice introduction for this. And you're welcome to start playing with this right away, even if the assignment doesn't require it. All right. And also, to go back and look at your previous assignments and see how you can introduce some CSS. At any rate, this is what we had last time. We took our Olympic web page and we added a little bit of color to it. All right. I'm not saying these are the best colors. Um, these colors were chosen so that they would really stand out. All right. So we have blue text, we have sort of a goldish background, and we have red links. Let's look at the code for this. And you'll see that we have a section of our page, it's in the head section, that contains a style tag. That tells the browser that you're not in HTML land anymore. We're speaking a different language here. We're speaking CSS language. So the browser interprets this as CSS. And CSS really is a, your CSS on your page is going to be a series of rules. Your rules consist of two things. Number one is the selector. The selector identifies what gets this rule. All right. So in this case, the body gets this rule. So everything contained within the body, which, by the way, is your entire web page, your entire window, is going to get this rule. A background of EEC600, and we'll talk about that code in a minute. And a color of blue. So the background relates to the background color, of course. The color refers to the color of the text. Now, the A has a color of red, which means the font of links are going to be red. The background is still gold. All right? This is the cascading part of the cascading style sheet. In other words, you can define rules on several levels. 
and those rules sort of cascade down. So if I didn't, if I didn't define any rule for the link, all right, um, then it would take a combination of the browser's rules and any of my other rules that I've defined. So in this case, it would have a background of, of uh, gold, and it would have the browser's default for the color of the link. But here I've gone in and I've specified I want the color of the links to be red. Therefore, it makes the color red. What's the background color? Well, the background color it gets from the body rule. Because after all, these links are part of the body tag, right? Yes. Exactly. So like if I, the question was if I made the paragraph tag, let's say, if I put a selector of P and do something like this, background white, I save it, and if I go and view it, then the paragraphs have a white of a background. So you can sort of notice, again, the body has a gold background. This is part of the body. These things that are part of paragraphs have a white background. But they still have a blue text. Why? I didn't say that paragraphs should have blue text. Well, paragraphs are part of the body. So it takes the blue for the text from the body tag, and it takes the white for the paragraph from the paragraph tag. All right? So these things work in combinations. And think of it as being higher level and lower level. Paragraphs are part of the body. But the rule for paragraph sort of supersedes anything for the body. All right? So if I define a color for the paragraph, a background color for the paragraph, it supersedes the background color for the body. But if I don't declare a font color, for the paragraph, then it gets the font color for the body. All right. My suggestion is to play around with this and try different combinations and see how it goes and so on. Um, now, by implication, we can make everything on the page have a different color. Right? We can make every single tag on our page have different colors. All right. That doesn't mean that it's a good idea to do that. Right? Remember that you're using colors to sort of highlight things and to sort of focus the user's eye on certain sections that are important and so on. If you kind of go into overkill with the colors, then you lose that effect, right? It's like the difference between someone that screams all the time versus someone who's very soft-spoken, who gets angry or gets excited and screams one time, right? Um, someone screams all the time, you're gonna, that you're going to become numb to that. You're not even going to pay attention to it. Uh, whereas if someone is soft-spoken and speaks very loudly, you're going to say, wow, this must be important, and you're really going to pay attention to that. Sort of that same way with color. If you use too many colors, if you have overkill with the colors, then the user will sort of become numb to it and not associate any specific meaning with the colors. But if you carefully use colors in a certain way, then the user will know that, hey, this is a, this is a different color, so that means something. All right? There's some importance to it. And you can see, even though this isn't the, the best design web page, you can see how the different colors sort of organize stuff for the user into sections. And that's sort of a good thing. All right. You can specify colors several different ways. For certain colors, you can specify the name of the color. And these are your basic colors, but it goes beyond the basic colors. Um, let's Google real quickly HTML color names. And
like coral, salmon, dark salmon, light salmon, crimson red, fire brick, dark red, pink, light pink, and so on down the line. You can specify these names and you'll get these colors. All right. You can also specify an RGB code. And RGB stands for red, green, and blue. Because any color is a mix of those three primary colors. All right. And for example, the color orange has a lot of red in it, has a little bit of green, and has no blue in it. A darker orange has still a lot of red. It has a little bit of green, less than orange, and still has no blue. Whereas orange red has a lot of red and just a teensy bit of green in it. Remember, for those of you that maybe have studied art or studied physics, this relates to different color light, not different color of pigments, not like different colors of paint, because there's a little bit different rules as far as that goes. But really, a lot of red and a little bit of green will give you that very reddish color of orange called orange red, and so on down the line. The hex code is simply a different way to represent this. Whereas each of these two digits relates to these numbers just expressed in hexadecimal. And what is hexadecimal? Hexadecimal is a number system that's base 16 and not base 10 like our number system. Our number system is base 10, right? In other words, you count 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Then 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 2, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. With hexadecimal is base 16. So you actually have 16 digits. So you have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Then you use letters for the digits 0 through, or, uh, 11 through 15. So 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. A, B, C, D, E, F. All right? So, just like our number system, if we have a number like 99, let's make it 98 instead. This position is 10 to the second, or 10 to the first power, and this is 10 to the zeroth power, or 1. So this means nine tens and eight ones. We had a number like 279. It would be 2 times 10 to the second, or two hundreds. 7 times 10 to the first, or seven tens, and nine times ten to the zero, or ones. With hexadecimal, if I had a number like, if I was going to convert a hexadecimal number to decimal, if I had a number like A7, instead of being ten to the first and ten to the zeroth, this would be sixteen to the zeroth, which is still one, and 16 to the first, which is 16. So A is 10, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A. So this would, if I was going to convert this to decimal, this would be 10 times 16 plus 1 times 7. So this would be 167 in decimal. All right. So. In RGB, if I were to have something like this, RGB of, let's, let's do one, uh, 255, 69, and 0. Each of these turns into two hexadecimal numbers. So 255 is actually... 15 times 16 plus 15 times 1. 
So that would actually be FF. 69 is 4. Um, four sixteens plus five ones, right? Because four sixteens is sixty four, and that leaves five left over, so it's five ones, and zero would be zero sixteens and zero ones. So RGB of two fifty five sixty nine zero translates to a hex code of FF forty five zero which if you look at our chart, I got the same answer that they did. So that's kind of comforting. All right. Now here's the good news. If you didn't understand anything I said about hexadecimal and zero through F and how many sixteens and all that, all you have to do is use the numbers on the chart and you'll get it right. All right. So in other words, If I were to look at this chart, and say, I want that color of green, that is a hex code for it. All right? So they will give you the hex codes for the different colors. And even if you don't understand anything about hex codes or base 16 or anything like that, all you have to do is use that. Or you could use an RGB of 16, 109, and 6, and that would work as well. All right? And again, in some cases, you can use a color name. All right? Um, there are millions of possibilities. It would be 16 to the 6th power to the 5th power, something like that. And that's a lot of combinations for colors. And not all of them have names, all right? But some of them have names, in, like, like I showed before, including some of the basics, uh, but also, um, you know, some not so basic colors. Now, um, now that we know how to define colors, the question becomes how do, we come, how do we define colors that look good together? There's some people that have a gift for that, right? They can just pick out colors, whether you're talking about their clothing or decorating their house or whatever. They can just pick out things that go well together. But some of us don't have that talent, all right? Fortunately, there's science behind what colors look good together. And therefore, what you can use is you can actually use a tool um, that exists called HTML color generators to find a set of colors that go good together. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to search for HTML color scheme generator. All right, and what this allows you to do is this allows you to pick, first of all, sort of the prime color that you want. All right, like let's say I decide I want my site to have a goldish color. So I could pick like maybe a color over here. Could pick a color over here. I can then pick the style that I want. There's several styles. There's monochromatic. And monochromatic is where everything is sort of uh, the same shade or, or different shades of the same color. There is trichromatic where you use complementary colors. That would be like this. Let's see, what's that called? Adjacent trichromatic or adjacent three colors. This is a triad of colors. This is a tetrad of colors. And this is freestyle where you get to make up a color scheme that you want. 
Let's keep it simple and let's stick with monochromatic. What this will give me is this will give me a list of five or six colors, looks like five, that I can use that according to the science of optics and color blending and all that should look good together. All right. Now the other thing that you should keep in mind is in addition to these you always have white and black and you always have gray. All right. Um, what do you think the hex code of gray is going to look like? Or the RGB code of gray? Um, it could, but the important thing is 127 would be sort of a moderate, medium gray. But the important thing to remember is that for gray, the RGB levels are the same. All right. So this would be sort of a medium shade of gray. This would be a gray that was very dark that was closer to black. This would be a very light shade of gray that would be close to um, white. So if the three numbers are the same, it's a shade of gray. All right. Um, in terms of, of, of hex code, you know, if you had 909090, that would be a shade of gray. Or if you had F0, 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 that would be a very light shade of gray. If I had 0F, 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 that would be a very dark shade of gray. All Fs is white. All zeros is black. Again, if you think about it in terms of color, all zeros means that all the lights are turned off. The red light's off, the green light's off, and the blue light's off. So if you have no light shining on a screen, the screen's going to be black. All right? F, 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 F are those three lights turned up all the way. So if you have red turned up all the way, green turned up all the way, and blue turned up all the way, the screen's going to be white. And then as you adjust it, if you keep turning them up and down by the same amount, you go through the different shades of gray. So this color scheme generator gives us five colors. It also, keep in mind that you have white, black, and different shades of gray at your disposal. That is going to be the, enough for a lot of web pages. Remember, the idea is, is you don't want to overwhelm the user with color. You want to use color to accent and to emphasize things. So you don't necessarily want to bombard the user with 50 different colors. All right? You want to just use color in a way that's going to accent things. So let's go back to our web page. And let's create a color scheme. And let's do it a little more carefully. I'm going to make the body have a background of white. and a color of black. By the way, if you don't have a better idea of what to do, that's always a good, safe choice. Dark text on a light background. We could even make it look a little bit different by giving it a color of RGB 32, 32, 32. That's not going to be black, but it's going to be a dark shade of gray. I'm then going to go and I'm going to say H1. I want to have a background of, and I can actually look at the color palette. Oops. I didn't want to do that. Let's say H1s, I want to look, I want to have the color of this, which is F3, EC, A3. F3, EC, A3. Let 
think that's right. So let's just go and save this and see what it looks like. Pardon me? Oh, yeah, I should have a semicolon here. Actually, the browser probably would have forgiven me for that, but it's a good practice to get into. All right, so there you notice that the page is white, and I'm only using the H1. I'm only using a different color for the H1. All right. I could possibly then go and say, well, let's make the H2s this color. DOC76B. Whoops, that should be H2. All right, so now all my H1s look a certain way, and all my H2s look a certain way. And I could continue that down the list for H3s and so on. Maybe we'll make 8B801C. All right, and they're down the line. And you're noticing already that, well, this certainly isn't a beautiful page. We're moving in the right direction, all right, of, of making the page look more professional. All right, and notice again, we use a color scheme that sort of fits, right? The Olympics, you think of gold and gold medals and all that kind of stuff, all right? But we're using the color to sort of organize the page for the person. So if they're looking, they see the way this is organized that, you know, this is sort of a main section. And then underneath gymnastics, there's a men and women's spot. All right? Likewise under basketball, likewise under closing ceremony. All right? Now again, you don't want overkill on this. You just want to use the right number of colors that will... Um, Make the page look good and provide some sort of visual cues for your user to understand how the page is laid out and how the page is structured. Any questions over this? All right, so now we have one of our pages with this color scheme. If I click on page two, remember I created a second page. Notice it doesn't have that color scheme. Well, what can we do to fix that? Well, we could go and open up this page, and I could copy and paste that style in here. So now the second page has that look. What's the problem with copying and pasting the style from one page to another? Well, I mean, there's no problem with it. It worked. But what could be a future problem associated with it? Yes. If you want to change it, exactly. Here we only have two pages, right? But if you can imagine you had a site that had a whole bunch of pages on it. Let's say we decided we want to change something. And like, for example, this H3, I want to put white text on there because that's starting to get a little dark and the black text is a little hard to read. So I go in here on my page and I say H3, white. 
Let's say I want to do that to all my headings. All right, there I go. But if I go to the second page, I still have the old style. And you get inconsistency, all right? So that's the problem with it. And again, it's a problem with two pages. It becomes a gigantic problem when you have a whole bunch of pages. Because I could go back then and revise it and copy and paste it, but what are you going to have happen? You're going to forget to do that on one page, all right, or a set of pages. And you're going to have pages that look inconsistent. Now keep in mind that CSS isn't just about colors. It's about layout. It's about a consistency between your pages. So you want your pages to have a consistent look and layout. So forcing the, the developer to copy and paste the CSS between several different pages, you're going to end up having a problem with that eventually. And you're going to have pages that are going to be laid out inconsistently, and it's going to compromise the effectiveness of your web page. So what you can do is you can actually put your CSS code in a separate file. All right? It's called an external CSS file. And then you simply tell each page to use that CSS file. So how do you do that? Well, I'm going to go and create a new file. And I'm going to copy and paste the CSS in that new file. Actually, I'm going to cut and paste it in there. Now, when the CSS is in its own file, you don't need the style tag. You only need the style tag if the CSS is part of the HTML file. But if the CSS is its own file, then you don't need the style tag. So there you go. There's my CSS code. I'm going to go up and I'm going to save this. As a CSS file. I'm going to call it something like main, because it's my main style sheet. I could possibly have other style sheets, and we'll talk about why you would want to have other style sheets later on in the course. But I could call it main.css. So now I have my file called main.css, and all I have to do is I have to link each of the pages to that style sheet. Now, this is a different sort of link. This isn't a link like that you click on and go somewhere else. This is connecting the CSS and the HTML. So how you do that is you put the word link, href equals, and you put the name of the style sheet file. In my case, I called it style.css. I'm sorry, called it main.css. Type equals rel equals style sheet type equals text slash CSS. I'm just going to copy that to my second page. Oops, I got an extra something in there. I'm also coding something wrong, so I'm going to do a quick Google.
right, that looks correct. Oh. We save all these pages. There we go. Go between page one and page two, and they're styled the same way. Now, here's where the important thing comes in. Let's say I look at that H1 and say, you know, the white text on that H1 is hard to read. So let's make it black. All I need to do is go into my CSS file and say that the H1, I want the color to be black, which I could type in black. I could type in RGB000 or I could type in pound sign zero, 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 zero. So I can do whatever I want to with that. I go and save it, and there, I change it there. And more importantly, if I go and click on the second page, I've also changed it on the second page. All right, yes? Could you change the one page and not the other? The answer is yes. What you'd have to do is you'd have to have a combination of an external style sheet and uh, an embedded style sheet. So, like, let's say, for example, if on this page, on the first page, I wanted the H1s to be red, what I could do is I could say style. H1 background red. And what that would do then is, wouldn't change it on that one, but it would change it on that one. Now it's possible that you want to do that, all right? Uh, but a lot of times, especially with, with something like coloration, um, you want those things to be consistent. All right. Not to say that in some cases you wouldn't want them to be different. All right. You can also have multiple style sheets. For example, you could have a single style sheet to be like your main font, color, things like that. And then you might have different sections of your site that get a different style. All right. For example, a pages that have articles versus photo galleries. You might want those to be laid out a little bit different because they have different content. In which case, you could actually use two style, external style sheet files. Also, when we get into mobile uh, development, development of web pages for mobile devices, um, you might have a style sheet for how your page looks like on a desktop computer and a different style sheet for how it would look on a mobile device. All right, so there's all kinds of ways that you can mix and match these style sheet files, and you can end up having more than one style sheet file. But for now, we'll just stick with the one. Now, keep in mind, we're definitely not done with CSS. This is the introduction of it uh, and uh, lets you know sort of what the role of CSS is. All right. But we're going to continue to go over this in great detail. But what I'd like to talk about for the remainder of class today is images. All right. Because certainly web pages, um, you know, a key characteristic of them is that they're not just words and links. They can contain images as well. All right. Now, um, I mentioned at the beginning of the class about copyright. And we're going to respect copyright by when I take an image from somewhere, I'm going to give credit to the site that I found it on. All right. And I'll just put a little mention on the page, this, this image found at olympics.org or whatever. All right. So, let's go and let's Google U.S. Olympic basketball, and I'm going to search for an image here, yeah. 
I guess it really doesn't matter which image I pick. Now let's go with this one. So I'm going to right mouse and I'm going to save the image as and I'm going to save it in my Olympics folder. All right. Notice what it's called. And again, file extensions are turned on so I see the complete file name. It's called a whole bunch of numbers and letters dot JPEG. Um, there are three kinds of image types that are allowable on web pages. JPEGs that end in typically a JPG extension, but they can also end in a JPEG uh, and even some other extensions. GIF files, which end in GIF, and finally PNG files, which end in PN PNG. All right. I'm going to give this, I'm going to rename it just to make it easier to work with so I don't have to worry about typoing. I'm going to rename it BB Team. And I'm going to put it on my page. So I'm going to go and put it on this page. I'll put it here in the section about men's basketball. Now, from what we talked about about HTML before, we know that an image is going to have a certain tag that tells it, hey, this isn't plain old text. I don't want the words bbteam.jpg displayed. I want to actually show the contents of that image. So there's going to be a special tag for that. And that tag is IMG. All right. Now, as you can imagine, this is sort of like links, right? It's not enough to say I have an image. I have to say what image I want to display. A given website could have hundreds, thousands of images. I have to say specifically what image I want to see here. So I have to give it the name of the image. Now I'm going to assume that it's in the same folder as the web page. And the attribute for the, name, for the name of the image file is SRC. SRC. SRC stands for source. So I'm going to say the source of this image is bbteam.jpg, which matches what I saved it as. Now, there's another attribute that we have on images that we'll talk about in more detail later on in the class, but it's an alt attribute. And what this alt attribute is, is it's used primarily for people that are visually impaired and are using a screen reader to access the page. And what this does is it simply tells the user what the image is of. Now again, there's nothing you can do to show an image to someone that can't see, right? But at least you can put a little description of what that image is that they're, that they're not seeing. So USA Olympic Basketball Team. Now, the image tag doesn't really have an end tag. So when a tag doesn't really have an end tag, you can simply use a slash greater than sign at the end. And that sort of tells the browser, hey, this is a starting and ending tag all rolled into one. So if we do this, all right, I'm going to put credit. I'm going to put the name of the website that I got the image from. All right. That way I'm not violating any copyright laws. I'm allowed to do that because I'm a teacher in a classroom. If I was writing this website for a sporting goods store that I was running, that wouldn't be legal, even if I gave credit. I would need the permission of the copyright holder. But the fact that we're in a classroom, I can do it, and you as a student can do it too, just like with the term paper, provided you give credit. So let's save this. 
And we can now look at it. And there we go. There's the image. Now that isn't all that I have to say about images. But that's where we're going to stop today. All right. Um, we can use images a lot of different ways in addition to this. Uh, and we could resize images, and we can use images as links, and we can use images as backgrounds, and we can do all sorts of things. But that's sort of the basics of just adding an image to your page. Any questions? Yes. How do you make, I, I can do that real quick. Um, let's go and I can answer that real quick. Let's look for the Olympic rings. That would be a great background. And I'm going to look for a big image of it. All right, this looks pretty big. I don't think it's the right color, so. Or is it? Yeah, it is. Okay. So I'm going to go, I'm going to save this. I'm going to save it as rings.jpg. Now, here's an example where the extension is JPEG. So I'm going to call it rings.jpeg. I'm going to save it in here. Now, to make it a background image, what you do is in your style sheet, I can actually say body background URL rings.jpg. All right. And if I did everything correctly, then it appears as a background. And what's better is it appears on the background of all my pages. Now, I'm going to go and give credit to whoever's rings these are. That might be something good to put in the footer. But that, in a nutshell, is how you do it. Now, notice that there's some problems associated with that. Namely, some of the text is hard to read up against that. So one thing that you want to do is you want to be careful for when you do that, that you do it in such a way that um, the page is still readable. And we could talk about different techniques to do that um, next time. But in a nutshell, that's what you do. One of the things you can do is just be sure the picture you take is, is primarily one color. The reason that this is difficult is, is um, given the fact that, that some of the rings are dark and some of the rings are light, if I pick a dark font, some of the text won't show. If I pick a light font, some of it won't show. What I could kind of do is I could kind of wash out this image and make it look like a watermark. I could, I could fade it a little bit so the text appeared up against any of them. But we'll pick up on that next time, and we'll talk more about images. Other questions? All right, we'll see you in lab.